This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Welcome to the Glazov gang. Thank you for joining me. This is Ari David. I'm Ari David, filling in for Jamie Glazov tonight, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Great Daniel Greenfield, the Shillman Journalism Fellow from the David Horwitz Freedom Center. And uh, Daniel, it's been a really eventful, well, whole summer with the uh, situations in the Middle East. Tonight, I'd like to focus on the situation with the Syrian refugees that Obama seems to be importing into America in mass numbers, and many of them apparently aren't quite so, uh, shall we say, uh, in the bonds of suffrage. Well, for one thing, uh, a lot of the Syrian refugees are neither Syrian nor refugees. Uh, people are just buying Syrian passports because at the end of the day, how are you going to check Syrians in the middle of a bloody civil war? Hundreds of thousands of people are dead. You can't just call the Syrian over the phone and ask, uh, is this guy legitimately living over on 424 destroyed city lane? So you've got a whole bunch of people uh, who are pretending to be Syrian refugees. It's a major problem in France. It's a major problem in Europe. Uh, it's a major problem here, but the Obama administration is really eager to find new undocumented Democratic voters anywhere it can. Yes. And isn't there a further concern, that being that they're neither Syrian nor uh, refugees, that they might actually be members of little groups like, say, Al-Qaeda or uh, Boko Haram or ISIS or that nice little group in Sudan called the Janjaweed or something like that? with intent to become sleeper cell members and lay in wait in America until there's an opportune moment to strike a wage jihad against people like you and me? Uh, we know what's happening. Law enforcement sources have said it. ISIS, even ISIS's people have said that they're doing this. So we know what's going on, but the administration doesn't care. And a whole lot of people are just invested in the business of bringing in refugees because refugees is a business. You've got religious nonprofits who are profiting from refugees because they get paid hundreds of dollars by the government to supposedly absorb these people, dump them into various uh, preferred communities. And these organizations are Christian, they're Jewish, but in the day they're making money off these refugees. And local residents are being hurt by this, and uh, American national security is being undermined by it. Yes. And, you know, I always jokingly say if the Democrat Party didn't abort so many of their potential voters, they wouldn't need to import so many of these potential voters. It's sort of an irony that you'd think that the Democrat Party would pick from one pool or another or keep most of their unborn voters alive and then they could really have a, uh, a powerful, sizable majority in the Electoral College. Well, they're reaching out and finding the oppressed peoples of the world so they can bring them here and then tell them to abort their babies. <laughs> yes. It, it's a bit also, of a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And it's also telling that the Democrats never decide to import people from prosperous parts of the world, like, say, Hong Kong, Singapore, or uh, South Korea, preferring instead to import them from places that are particularly rife with a high percentage of American-hating people. I've talked to an immigration lawyer from the UK, and he talked about just how hard it is just to get people from the UK uh, to legally come here because the administration doesn't want them, the government doesn't want them. But you know, if you're a 90-year-old Haitian who's HIV positive, uh, they will roll out the red carpet for you. That's ironic. Um, what other issues are of deep concern to you this week? I suppose you have a, a comment or two about the Democrats reaching their veto-proof, uh, let's just say, senatorial voting block today with the, uh, I like to call it, the Rosenberging of uh, Ms. Mikulski. Well, this was always going to happen. The rest of it was mostly a theatrical production. Obama was always going to get the votes, and even if he hadn't got the votes, he already made it clear to Congressman uh, Brad Sherman that he was going to do this anyway, one way or another, because we're not exactly living in a law and order society, we're living in a pen and phone society. So this was always going to happen. The point, of course, uh, is that it's important to expose it, it's important to push back against it, uh, without uh, really being too invested in the idea that uh, we can win this kind of rigged game. Yes. Do you think... Uh Senator Schumer from uh, your neck of the woods will survive politically unscathed with the, because I always assume that the entire reason that he came, say, out of the closet against the deal when he did is because he realized that there would be political cover for him in his districts and his state with the heavy Jewish populations in New York City, uh, and knowing that his vote wasn't necessary to uh, 
support the deal in the first place? Uh, internally, this was a battle within the Democratic Party. So you had different uh, parts of the Democratic Party. Uh, the left uh, going after some of the more conservative parts of the party. Uh, but then they, both sides knew that this was going to be settled and they knew how this was going to be settled. So it was, again, theater was an internal power play. Yes. And did you hear the news today that um, John Kerry, in uh, trying to console the Israelis and the Saudis, have offered both nations billions of dollars of aid? What struck me about the news is for the Democrats, which is constantly the party of uh, we don't want war, so, th so they say, isn't the best way to arrive at a war to arm both adversarial nations allied against one another, to arm them to the teeth so they can use the weapons against each other at some future date? I wouldn't necessarily trust Kerry's promises of uh, a military aid or Obama's promises of military aid. You might want to ask the Ukrainians uh, whom Obama told not to resist and not to fight back against the Russians. Uh, he promised them military aid. He did not deliver. He promised them non-military aid. He didn't deliver that either. Uh, the Syrians can tell you about that too. They were promised not, not military aid and they were promised non-military aid. They didn't get either one. So this is an administration that is really great at making promises and really bad at keeping them. Do you think Israel would have been a better position had they elected uh, Bogey instead of Netanyahu, considering that Bogey seems to have been become a hawk on the Iran issue. And because, let's just hypothetically say, if he was the prime minister and Israel's government was controlled by the power-hungry leftists, that they would be more likely to attack Iran, being that it would have fit their political interests to do so? Versus Netanyahu, who has it's to It's possible face that might be the case. Uh, Israel's situation is confusing in part because there's a heavy element of the left in the military and law enforcement, which is less interested in foreign policy and more interested in just breaking Netanyahu any way they can. So it's possible that they might sign off on it, but he's not a very credible figure. If Barack were in office, for example, he would have some credibility in doing something about that. Um, but the kind of people that the Labor Party is putting up now are just a complete joke. And he's a particularly corrupt character with some very dubious ties uh, to leftists in Europe and the United States. So uh, it's unknown who he would really be working for anyway. Right. And uh, what do you think that the, the mood of the uh, Israeli military is? Is, there, is it kind of like um, America in the 1960s with the Vietnam War, where a lot of the troops simply just don't want to be at war anymore after all they've been through with these endless wars that never seem to have uh, a clear-cut agenda at victory because Obama keeps putting the reins on Israel? Uh, Israel is somewhat conflicted, but the thing about Israelis is that they tend to focus on things at the moment. They don't really think, seem to think, they don't really tend to think all that long term a lot of the time. There are people who do think long term. Netanyahu is that way, but he's American educated. Uh, he really grew up here to a large extent, so he's not necessarily typical. A lot of the ordinary Israelis, uh, especially in the military, really tend to focus on things at the moment, uh, and they don't necessarily take a longer view. So right now they're thinking about things like the conflict across the border, particularly they're thinking about Iran and ISIS being next door uh, in Syria. Uh, they're not necessarily thinking about the nuclear bomb because that's a big picture thing and it's really going to be resolved at the top. Very interesting. Well, Daniel Greenfield from the uh, Sultan Kanish blog, the Shilman Journalism Fellow at the David Horwitz Freedom Center, thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's always a pleasure to have you and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Likewise, thank you for having me on. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. Um, make sure you support the Glashoff Gang. This show exists with your support. Go to uh, www.jamieglashoff.com and please make a contribution to our uh, crowdfunding fundraising effort. And make sure you go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is called the Glashoff Gang. This is Ari David in from Jamie Glashoff. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.